Hello and welcome. This is Monica Patrick and Lily Rodriguez from the CHEST Program Development Team, and we'd like to thank you for attending today's CHEST webinar using audience response systems for learner engagement. Drs. Mark Labercombe and John Scherner will discuss audience response systems as a teaching tool. This webinar is part of a series being provided by the CHEST Educator Development Subcommittee and the CHEST Education Committee to provide resources and support for the medical educator. This webinar will be recorded and we will provide a link to access the recording when it becomes available. Thank you to those who submitted questions in advance. If you have additional questions, please submit them in the chat window and they will be addressed if time permits. I will now turn the presentation to our panelists. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mark Labercombe here in Melbourne, Australia, and John. Hi, I'm John Scherner here in uh, Washington, DC. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thank you for getting on the, the webinar, everyone. It's great to have a bunch of participants. And thanks again, like Monica said, for those who submitted the questions in advance, which we hope to address during the presentation. So we're doing this on behalf of the Educator Development Subcommittee of the ACCP. And uh, as, as I guess we're, we're hoping to uh, illustrate some examples and how to use ARS to um, enhance your teaching. So we're going to cover um, an introduction and, and rationale for why to use audience response or ARS, some potential use cases, um, how to use ARS in terms of timing and, and distribution throughout your presentation, and also some lots actually examples of different questions and ways that you might use it optimally to help your learners engage. Next slide, please. Before we do it though, I did want to ask if um, the participants will be happy to participate in a poll. There are gonna be a few of these scattered throughout the, the session. So I'm gonna ask you to rate your uh, own personal experience of using ARS um, and you can see the options there. So please go ahead and, and rate those. Okay, so John, there's a bit of a mix. There's a couple of people who perhaps could be doing this session and rated it very high, uh, and then a bit of a mix is spread throughout it. So people who've used it or seen it used, and a few people who are using it in their own teaching. Good spread. So we'll try and address um, everyone's needs. Um, uh, hopefully we will be able to, but obviously we'll answer questions in the chat as well. So in terms of why to use ARS, um, it's an example or, or one method of making learning sessions more interactive. And the days of, you know, the sage on a stage standing up in front and delivering a one or two hour presentation and expecting that that means that the people in the audience will have um, heard, integrated, and be able to use that information and, and really have learned it is, um, is really gone. The literature in education and medical education is quite clear that audience participation and interaction makes learning outcomes uh, improve. Audience response is one way of making learning more interactive and it's particularly suited to large group settings. So it's somewhat less practical if you've got an audience of two, three, 500 people to break them up into small groups. Um, so audience response or ARS in that setting might be useful. Um, it is also useful in small groups um, as we'll show. And ARS is recommended for use in the sessions at CHEST annual meetings. Next slide, please. One of the things that has been measured in the education literature is um, that active learning on the behalf of your learners is um, requires engagement and um, bi-directional um, ideas and content flows. So again, not just someone standing up the front and, and speaking at an audience, but engaging them in the material, asking questions, taking their answers and um, involving them in the decision making around the case you're discussing, for example. And the benefits of that include that the audience pays um, closer attention for longer, um, it does promote better integration and, and higher order learning of the material. And there is evidence of some improved in performance on written examinations. So 
and a clear evidence of learning outcomes. Learners report that they feel more engaged when they are polled about the use of uh, or surveyed about the use of ARS in their sessions. They feel more stimulated and motivated to think and often the questions that are posed during their lectures encourage them to go away and study um, rather than uh, perhaps just going to the lecture and then being done with that. They also rate their presenters or their teachers more highly. So they rate the quality of the presentation more highly, they rate the speaker more highly, and they rate their own attention uh, as higher. Next slide, yep. So the teachers um, also report that their students look more interested and excited, they're more engaged, and they, they suspect that the students find the, the feedback that comes from having um, polling and, and audience response throughout the session really useful. There is quite a large um, literature around the use of ARS. There have been some um, references scattered throughout the slides so far, but we can provide more if people request them. Next slide. In terms of potential use cases, I like to um, use uh, an ARS slide up front just to um, get an idea of who's in the audience, um, uh, perhaps as an icebreaker as well, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, David Shulman has a short video on the use of ARS um, in the Chess Presenter uh, Resources section on the Chess website, um, and he talks about creating a teachable moment where um, you put up a question and you identify that, okay, well, there's uh, quite a lot of misunderstanding around the answer to that question, and then you discuss that question further, and it, it, uh, it helps the, the learners be curious as to, hang on, why did I get that wrong? Another way is to gauge the learner's experience and the understanding, and this means that you can modify your session as you're going if you're an, quite an agile teacher, and this can be really helpful. Um, I had a session recently with some medical students preparing for a multiple choice examination and on one of the questions about spirometry, the audience had 100% correct and the next question, it was an even distribution across all the, the responses and to me, spending time talking about the first question where they had 100% correct was a waste of time and it was much better to spend the time on the second question where their understanding was quite poor. So it enabled me to better adjust what I was delivering to their needs. And then lastly, um, learning le learner feedback um, is another way um, to use ARS. Next slide, please. So this is an example that I have sometimes used um, and some of my colleagues uh, where I work as well as an example of an icebreaker question. It happens to be a clickable image it, using the software Poll Everywhere. So you can get your learners to uh, say they like Star Trek or Star Wars. Um, I think, John, you have an example of, of another icebreaker. Next slide, please. Sure, yeah. So uh, this slide is also another example of a kind of a lead-in uh, question, not quite as much of an icebreaker, but uh, similar to what Mark did at the beginning of this uh, webinar, sort of you want to know who you're dealing with can be a great, great way to get a sense of who your audience is, um, especially if it's a large group that you don't know. This is an example of a question that I give at the beginning of an ultrasound course that we give every year to the area of fellows uh, who come from different backgrounds. We have internal medicine fellows, we have uh, critical care fellows that have a surgical background, um, there's ER uh, trained residents that are now doing critical care fellowship and so they have a lot of different background in ultrasound and it's always good for me to know who's out there in the audience and so if I'm giving a talk on RV assessment I just ask them to sort of rate themselves at the beginning and you can see um, here with this group you know it was a pretty limited uh, skill they weren't super confident in their in their skills and it just tells us where we're kind of starting from uh, when you have a diverse uh, diverse audience so I think these are very useful types of, uh, of questions. Next slide. Yeah, so that, that's great. I think um, we just wanted to check in with um, the participants at this point and, and uh, again, poll you and ask whether um, things are going along okay. Is there anything that we need to pause on or, or go back over? So please feel free to answer the poll. Next 
Okay, that's great. Um, thanks everyone, we'll move Very straight well. along then. <laughs> All right, next slide please. So again, I already mentioned David Shulman's um, presentation, Best Practices in the Use of ARS, and uh, this is just a screen capture from, from his presentation. Um, so this is available on the CHEST website. Um, we're not intending to duplicate or replicate. We're intending to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, um, add further information or, or a different sort of form to his presentation. So um, please do check out his presentation on the CHEST website. All right, so our first participant questions. So someone uh, asked in advance when they registered for this session, is it best to use ARS as a pre and post assessment or interspersed throughout the lecture? Um, so that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, next slide. So we, um, I do both. Um, so I use it as a pre post. So sometimes I will assess um, or ask for the learner's self-rated um, experience, um, like John's slide about RV assessment uh, a few slides ago. Um, but I will also sometimes ask them, you know, multiple choice questions or, or get them to click on an image and identify the abnormality. Um, and then often I will then repeat that after the session to sort of check in that there has been uh, learning throughout the session. But I think where ARS is really useful is when you use it throughout the session. So um, this information is from a uh, Annals of the ATS uh, article um, by Dr. McAllister and Dr. Lenz, um, which discusses um, audience um, participation and um, uh, attention uh, and, and refers to the psychological literature that suggests only about a 10 minute attention span. It discusses the primacy recency effect whereby uh, the retention of material delivered in a session is highest for that delivered at the very start or at the end. Uh, and they recommend that using ARS and other interactive activities should occur every 10 to 15 minutes because of that attention span issue. So they suggest dividing your, your session, however long it is, into 10 to 15 minute cycles where you have a, an initial period of um, didactic information delivery followed by an engaging activity and then some lighter teaching to consolidate the information towards the end. So this is one of the suggested um, modes uh, for a 60 minute lecture time. And the next slide shows another way that might be able to do it. So if you break your 60 minute lecture into sort of 20 minute blocks and then you have some harder teaching up front, some audience engagement activities in potentially including ARS, but also potentially including other things like small group activities. And then a period of consolidation at the end of that 20 minute cycle before you start the next one. And this ensures or encourages at least the audience um, who may have their attention waning or wandering to re-engage and then have a better chance that the information you deliver and the didactic components will actually uh, hit home. Next slide, please. So another poll question for you guys. Um, according to Lenz and McAllister, interactive components, including ARS, should be placed at intervals. Please go ahead and answer. Okay, good. So everyone is paying attention and um, this is an example of using a poll to check in with the audience um, to assess that information you've just delivered has, uh, has been understood and, and integrated. Next slide, please. So the other thing to make clear is that depending on the size of the audience, depending on the nature of the session, it might not only be ARS, but it might be ARS in combination with other interactive activities, um, such as uh, putting up a, a poll and, and seeing what people uh, respond to a particular question then and asking them to discuss with their partner or in a small group and then re-polling them or um, discussing the uh, responses in the larger group. For example, that might be one effective way to use ARS in a larger group, but this isn't the only interactive activity, but it's a really helpful one. Next slide. 
So another participant question, is there a process which can be used to ensure the questions are posed that provide optimal data from the results? So I think John, you're going to address this. Yeah, so that's another good question is, you know, how do you, how do you formulate good questions that can give you meaningful data uh, or, or, or give you what you want from your session? I think the, the key here is what's your purpose, right? When you're writing your question, are you, are you wanting just to assess knowledge? In which case there are definitely guidelines for how you should structure your question. Or is your goal really to, to just generate discussion? In which case you may want to deviate from some of the sort of traditional sort of question writing rules. But uh, we're going to go through a few of those and then just go through some examples of different ways to integrate ARS uh, into a session. So in general, as I said, rules for question writing apply for the most part. Um, but the design is going to vary depending on what you want to do. And so um, depending on your goal is going is to be how you're going to structure uh, your question. Next slide. So here's an example question. Go ahead and uh, click through the animations on this, please. Yeah, so uh, anatomy of a question here, basically, this is also from the uh, from the CHEST uh, Faculty Guide website. Uh, this was put together by, I think, Amy Morris and others, um, and is available to you uh, for more detailed reference. But in general, there are three parts to a, a well-designed question. There's the stem, where the the material is presented, uh, and the objective should be, should be clear. Uh, there are then the key and the distractors. Uh, one more click, please. So the key being the correct answer and the distractors are the uh, less correct answers. Many of you may be familiar with this terminology, but just to, just to, to review that there. So when you're writing, next slide, when you're writing a, a question, the STEM, the key here is to keep it straightforward and simple, right? You don't want to try to trick the audience. Um, you want it to have all of the information that's needed and not a lot of extraneous stuff. This should include a good, you know, basic pace, patient presentation, including sort of the setting that the, that the situation is taking uh, place in for, for case-based discussions. Avoiding true or false type of questions is a, is a good general rule, and also avoiding all of the following except questions um, is something you should, should try to do. It's very tempting, I think, to write those kinds of questions because they're relatively easy to write, and they can make you feel like you're maybe testing multiple concepts at one time, but in reality, they're probably clouding the picture. Uh, they're making it harder for the learner to figure out what's being asked and it brings into the sort of the equation test taking skills and so you may not be getting an accurate assessment of what your learners really know. Uh, again you want to stay focused with a single objective. You don't want to test multiple domains uh, as far as treatment, diagnosis, other things all in one question. Keep it simple and focused to one thing and avoid terms of degree such as frequently, mostly, or commonly if you can because these create gray areas that again can cloud the picture for the for the learners and, and may not give you as, as clear data. Next slide. Uh, the distractors, now uh, important thing here is these don't have to be completely wrong, they're just not as good as the correct answer. Um, you should also avoid all or none of the above uh, types of questions. Um, avoiding nonsense distractors, this is one case where you may want to deviate from, a, you know, a, if you're writing a test question, uh, humor is probably not really appropriate or appreciated by the uh, test takers, but in a, in a presentation setting, that may be something that can really be beneficial. And so a nonsense distractor may have a role in that setting. I think uh, what is uh, consistent across everything is that your distractors and your key look alike. They're structured the same way. Uh, they don't have different grammar or a different length um, so that one of them stands out. And in general, your multiple choice questions should have four options, maybe three on, on occasion. So next slide. And then, of course, the key is your, your single best answer. And this is, again, I think a major deviation from regular test uh, question writing where you want a clear best answer. Um, if you're trying to assess knowledge, again, that, that's, that's appropriate. But if you're trying to generate discussion, it may be very uh, useful to have more than one answer that has significant merit. Um, next slide. So here's an example of, of such a question. This is a case presentation, uh, essentially, of a, of a PE that's hemodynamically stable, but with um, significant RV strain. So this would be an intermediate risk PE. Um, I think the, the STEM is, is, is good. It's uh, good data, it's clear, um, it gives you what you need, and then it asks a very straightforward question about what's your man management strategy. And the key and the distractors all look the same. There's not one that's more, more specific or includes dosages or things like that. Um, the problem with this question is it's covering a gray area, right? This is a controversial, area management of, of, of intermediate risk PE. Um, and so there is no one clear answer, at least to my mind, and people may bring different uh, practice pattern settings and 
data that they they know uh, to the equation. So it wouldn't be a good test question, but it's a great question to generate some discussion, maybe make the audience a little bit uncomfortable, make them commit to something, um, and then you can have good substrate to have a discussion to enter, introduce some data and to talk about things. So this would be a, a good use of, of a discussion generating question. Next slide. Um, just to highlight the things you want to avoid, as I said, sort of an unfocused STEM, right, where the, where the, the learner reads the question and they don't know what's, uh, what's being asked of them. And then on the on the answer side, you know, you don't want options that uh, where they don't stand out in general, right, where there's not a um, where there's significant overlap between topics or where there's multiple domains or topics being tested, um, such as treatment versus versus um, diagnosis, things like that. Next slide. So here's an example of an unfocused STEM, uh, which is not true regarding uh, benign asbestos pleural effusion. Well, again, um, a couple of things here are bad about this, right? It's, it's asked in the negative again, so it can be confusing and may take some time to read through and, and interpret without really involving the knowledge or, or what you're trying to assess um, and secondly you don't really know what's being asked until you read the answers um, and so it's asking a, a not a not question um, so this would be one that I, that I would avoid because it's just not a focus enough uh, stem next slide here's another example that uh, mark can go through yeah so this is um, an example from some years ago now when a naive young teacher uh, put together this slide and and I look back on it um, with some shame and embarrassment. Um, <laughs> uh, there's way too many options here. Um, it's difficult to read. It's difficult for the learners to understand. Um, forgetting for a second that I'm using millimeters of mercury rather than kilopascals for the for the units. Um, it's assessing two different skills. So it's assessing acid base analysis and AA gradient calculations. Um, I, I just I, I think this is a, an example of what not to do, which is why I put it in the slides. Next slide. Thanks, Mark. Here's another question we got uh, from from one of the uh, folks who registered, and I think this is a great question. It really gets to kind of the crux of the of the matter of, of using ARS in your presentations. Um, and so, um, at least for me, when I give a talk now, I pretty much always 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 have some sort of of audience response. Um, integrated into the to the talk and that's great i think it's good uh it's better than not having anything interactive but just putting in a few sort of questions throughout there it, it really is uh ineffective or inadequate for generating the kind of sort of lively engaged sort of classroom and audience that, I, that i'm striving for and so how do we go to the sort of the next level and this gets to some of the stuff that mark was talking about and some of the stuff that was in dr shulman's video as well is how do you use the this to really get an active uh, learning environment going well a couple of things you can do to start with you can just mix up your multiple choice questions and include things like images videos more multimodal um, presentations to liven things up a little bit you can get away from multiple choice questions altogether and use things like clickable images um, word clouds uh, other tools like that I'm going to show you some examples of those coming up you may be limited by your software and which software you're using um, and so that may be a constraint, but you can you can work around those generally. But I think the real answer is to pair the ARS or use the ARS as a tool to really use some of these other interactive techniques where you generate discussion, uh, have some peer instruction, have people working in teams um, and things like that. The ARS can really be a great tool to introduce that stuff. Next slide. Um, I mentioned the word clouds. I'll show you an example of that. A picture quadrant would be another type of question. You put an image up and divide it into, into quadrants and ask the audience to select the abnormality or comment on, on something in one of the quadrants. The think, pair, share model, many of you may be familiar with. This is a form of peer teaching, right? You present a question. You have them think about the answer. They get in a small group or talk to their neighbor about what they think, and then and then you ask people to share their response with the with the larger group. You can integrate ARS into this by uh, doing, as has been mentioned before, sort of the vote um, and then discuss with your, your colleagues in a small group and then re-vote and see how things uh, go from there. Next slide. So here's an example of that. This is another, uh, another VTE question. So uh, to a group of medical students, we presented a case of a, of a DVT and told them a DVT is on your differential ask them what's the likelihood of diagnosis. So again, we're doing case-based learning. Uh, we ask them to, uh, we're showing them how we approach 
uh, you know, the management of, or the diagnosis of ET rather than just telling them about that. And we asked them to vote. And then we asked them to get into a small group, um, discuss their answers, uh, and then we have them re-vote. And you could show them the answers to the first poll before that, or you could show them the answers together. It really is up to you how you do it. In this case, we, we didn't show them the answers. Initially, we had them discuss in a group for three to five minutes until the discussion kind of died down. And then we re-polled them and then showed them the results, which are shown on the next slide. And so you could see, you know, in this group, uh, initially they were kind of spread across. There a third of them each said low, intermediate, or high probability. But when we had them discuss in groups, um, based on the case presentation, uh, and then revote, the audience kind of moved towards an intermediate risk, the majority of them. And so this is a great sort of way to now discuss what's going on and get into their thought process. Um, you can ask somebody who voted one way and then changed their mind, you know, what they thought initially and why they changed. Or you could ask somebody who didn't change their mind, you know, why did you hold out? Why did you say stay high probability, even though the majority of the people bought the argument for a for an intermediate probability? So a great way to, to generate discussion. Uh, even with a large group. Next slide. Some other ideas for integrating this uh, this stuff into your into your um, talks would be um, you can do an audience poll and then compare that to some published result that's out there in, in the literature. You could ask them to predict the outcome of an intervention um, or an experiment. Um, you can use it in a pro con type of setting if you have a panelist of ex a panel of experts or a pro con type of debate. You can tell the audience that they're going to vote uh, at the end for the winner or the loser. You know. Um, that'll definitely keep people engaged when they know they're going to vote on somebody, they're going to pay more attention to the, to the discussion. Um, and then a great way, as was mentioned earlier, is to use ARS to get feedback either during your lecture, as Mark has done, um, example for you here, or you can do it after the lecture. And I'll show you a few examples of that as well. Next slide. So I think, uh, is this going to be a poll or this may not be a poll. So this would be a, a way you could use a poll. So I'd have the audience, uh, Oh, here it is. So it is going to be a poll. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's have the audience rate your level of burnout, uh, non-mild, significant, or severe. All right. So we had a pretty even split between mild and significant um, from this group. So that's interesting. Let's see what the national average shows. For that. So it looks like we're having a little trouble with our slides, but you know the next thing I would show would be a slide of the uh, data that was of a survey of nationally of pulmonary and critical care medicine docs that showed you know 40% said moderate and 40% said severe. So compared to that, our uh, our group would be our group would have less burnout. There's our slide. Our group would have less burnout than uh, than the national average, and that could be a point of discussion. It lets the audience identify as a group, and uh, and kind of maybe can discuss why they have less burnout than their national colleagues. Next slide. This is just a, a simple multiple choice question, but with images for answers. Um, instead of images as part of the question. Um, this is asking another ultrasound question, asking about TAPSI. Um, so you can figure out, do they know what TAPSI is and, and do they know how to measure it or do they recognize how to measure it at least? Um, next slide. Again, a clickable, clickable image type of slide. So uh, you know, asking them to identify the aortic valve. Um, if you don't have clickable image software, you could simply label the boxes. And, uh, and convert it to a multiple choice uh, type of question. So just some more ideas for sort of integrating audience response software into your presentations. Next slide. And again, another fairly simple example of a, of a, of a predict an outcome type of question. So you show the audience an EKG, um, it, there's an intervention given, the patient gets adenosine and you ask them what's gonna be the rhythm um, after that. Um, and ask them to to pull on that. Just a way to kind of mix up the questions uh, rather than straightforward uh, multiple choice type questions. Next slide. And this this is an example of a word cloud, which basically it starts as a blank screen and the audience can free text in their responses and they show up on the screen. Um, if you haven't seen that before, I use this um, at the end of my talks. I usually ask the audience to to uh, put in one thing that they've learned uh, from the talk. Um, actually, I, I like doing this at the end of the day. If I give a lecture in the morning, I'll do it at the end of the day. 
um, but you can do it right at the end of the session and it forces them to consolidate their knowledge, right? Think of one thing they learned um, and they can share it with group. If I notice something didn't come up there that I think is important, I can, can highlight it at that time. Um, and also, frankly, it, it's, it's nice. It makes you feel a little better about yourself uh, knowing that they at least took one thing out of the, uh, out of the uh, lecture. Next slide. And then finally, you know, there's a lot of, uh, Chess has a lot of, of, of medical learning games you know, online and at the conferences, you know, Bill Kelly's always got, uh, got some a group of people gathered around one of his games there. And these can be a great way to, uh, to, to liven up your, your session or your lecture. Um, the, and there's a reference here that I can share. I think it got cut off on the slide, but um, it goes through some of the elements of gaming that, make, uh, that can make the classroom more interactive and fun. Uh, the Kahoot, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's a, a, a online sort of learning uh, interactive feature. Uh, it's sort of like trivia where people get points for answering questions correctly and faster. The faster you answer, the more points you get. Uh, my kids brought this home from like when they were in third grade from class and they were so excited about it. And I thought it would be interesting. So I thought I'd put it together for my fellows. And as I was doing it, I was thinking it might be kind of juvenile. Um, but I guess it just shows that I'm getting old because when I presented it to my fellows, they absolutely loved it. They thought it was one of the best things that we've done. And so um, bringing sort of these elements of games into the competition. So things like leaderboards, points for correct answers, uh, breaking them into teams and having competitions, offering prizes are, are other ways to really sort of, um, you know, motivate the classroom, let them have fun. Because at the end of the day, you know, as you know, they're going to forget a lot of what they've learned, but your goal is really to try to inspire them, motivate them. And if they're having fun, I think they're more likely to do that. Next slide. So just to summarize, um, I think, you know, we've gone over uh, ARS in some detail, both the, the theory and, and then hopefully some examples. Um, lectures using ARS are, are more highly rated and they've been shown to improve learning. Um, you can use ARS for multiple different purposes, and the questions can take many forms. So hopefully, we've we've demonstrated that. And I think combining ARS with other techniques for interactive learning uh, can be highly effective. And as as others have said, you know, being an agile teacher um, is really, I think, the best way to go. It can certainly be challenging, but um, be reacting to your audience and engaging with them on the fly can really help uh, uh, enliven your sessions. That is all we had, I believe. Um, be happy to take any questions you guys might have. Mark, anything you wanted to add? No, I think that's great, John. Um, thanks for all of the examples. Um, I'm sitting here waiting for anyone to put a question in the chat box, or uh, we can see we can see what what people come up with. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Labercombe and Dr. Scherner. We do have about five to ten minutes if people do want to submit any questions. Um, it looks like we might be getting one right now. We just got a first question. Um, can you give us some examples of systems that we can easily use for ARS? Any input on that, Dr. Lavercombe or Scherner? John, do you want to take that or, or me? Uh, so, so the example, most of the examples I gave were uh, Poll Everywhere, um, which is, I think, one of the first ones out there, and it's the one I'm most familiar with. It does have several capabilities um, beyond just the straight question and answer. Um, you know, many of the universities still have the Turning Point software, which is a, a an, another one that's that's out there. Uh, there's a couple other ones. Um, uh, there's one called, I think, Socrates or something like that. Mark, I don't know if you know the name of that one. There, there's several. Yeah, so that one's called Socrative. Um, yeah. I think it's T-I-V-E, um, which I've used a little bit, but I have to say, I, I like you, also use Poll Everywhere, and my university and also my health service both um, have, uh, you know, corporate licenses. So obviously, it makes sense to try to to use something consistent with other teachers. Um, so that the learners get, uh, you know, consistent um, presentations uh, and they don't need to use multiple different software platforms. Um, not, I, I, you know, I, I think Poll Everywhere has some really good advantages um, and some really good features, but I think there are, Socrative is another web-based one. And then, as you said, obviously, there's, there's the sort of older style uh, clickers um, that you get at conferences, for example. 
Looks like we just got another question. Any advice about how different cultures respond to ARS and interactive educational formats? Ah, that's a good one. Um, so uh, I I don't have literature on that. Um, I have to admit, John, do you? I don't actually. That's a great question. I haven't seen. Uh, I don't have any literature on that specifically. I'd have to look and see where some of this the stuff that I do have came from. I, I honestly didn't um, didn't delve too deep to see well, if it was a diverse group or if it was from a you know single center type of stuff and where those centers were. Um, I can tell you from my experience at um, you know just at, at Chess, which is a, a fairly international um, audience, it it doesn't seem to me there's a, a lot of uh, of differences in the use of the polling. I think that's one of the good things about it is that it's uh, it's relatively anonymous, um, so people are much more comfortable you know pressing a button than raising their hand and talking. I think uh, there may be some differences um, among ind individuals. I don't know if it's cultural or just individuals. Probably uh, as far as when you try to get them to engage and sort of talk to their neighbor and and generate more discussion that way. Um, but that's a great question that I don't have a great answer to. Yeah, I apologize that I don't either, but um, I would just um, add on to what John just said as well. I, I found one of the, the real strengths of using ARS is providing a safe space for learners to commit themselves to an answer. Um, I think, you know, particularly dealing with medical students, but also, um, you know, fellows and trainees that, uh, you know, there is a social and and peer uh, potential consequence of putting yourself out there and then um, having your answer to be incorrect. Um, and I think that's fine. There's certainly a place for that, but sometimes giving them a, 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 an anonymous opportunity to commit themselves to an answer to a, a question um, and test their own knowledge where they're the only ones who are going to know whether they got it right or wrong. They get immediate feedback on their understanding of the material um, and there's no uh, negative social uh, consequence. I think that's really powerful and it has been welcomed in my learners. I would say that my um, my student population is very diverse. We have uh, a lot of local Australian students, but we also have a, a large population of international students um, from a variety of backgrounds. And anecdotally, as John said, I, I haven't noticed much difference in their acceptance of ARS, um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't have literature to support that. So it looks like we have two more questions. If um, Dr. Lavercombe and Dr. Scherner, if you wouldn't mind, perhaps we could answer these two quickly before signing off. Sure. Sure. Great. So our next question is, do you think questions prior to discussion of topic is helpful to increase engagement? Or do you recommend asking a question after discussion in lecture format or a mix? I like a mix. John? I, I do too. I, I mean, I like to, uh, I think as Mark said, I think when you when you work it into the into the lecture mixed in is, is the most effective way. I do sometimes ask a question up front, particularly if there's been like a signed reading or a, a pre-reading material to get a sense of, you know, where, what people have uh, have read. And I also, as I mentioned earlier, just to see what, what your audience sort of baseline knowledge is. Um, I don't use a ton of it after the after the lecture to, to test uh, assessment um, of, of knowledge, but um, it certainly could be could be used for that as well. So I think it, it just depends on what you like. Um, I think as uh, as Mark said, and I think the data would suggest that you know doing it interspersed is is probably the most effective use of it. Great. So our final question for this session will be. I am concerned about technology failure when I use this in a presentation at national conferences. What is your experience with using polling outside of the academic setting? Go ahead, Marker. I, uh, I, I have used polling um, in department meetings, uh, you know, planning meetings and um, you know, trying to uh, sort of um, uh, direction planning, you know, 12 months out sort of type things where we're trying to work on priorities and so on. So that is one setting um, outside of academia where I've used it. 
Um, I think the, the first part of the question about um, technology failure is a fair question um, and I think uh, it's, yeah. it's difficult. We rely on, um, you know, whichever uh, conference centre or, or organisation is running the session to provide us with the technology to, to run it properly. I guess what I would say though is that if the in that setting, if the polling isn't working, um, it's very likely that the um, PowerPoints also aren't working. Um, and so you, you, you're you going to rely on the tech people there to get things going. John, have you had anything like that happen to you where you've been yeah, unable so, to go ahead? Yeah, so I mean, uh, so you can always, in the event of a technology fail, you can always revert to the old school, you know, the, the raising the hands or the uh, index cards or things like that. But I have actually not had any technology problems at National conferences. Um, I think, you know, it, um, there's always been great support and um, things have, have gone really well. Uh, outside of conference, national conferences, when I'm using it in my own sort of teaching and things like that, I, I, I do work at a facility with a robust uh, firewall and, and a lot of times we do have IT problems. And so, um, you know, it, it's definitely a concern. You have to plan for it. Um, and and I, it takes more work because you you know, I do more run throughs initially when I'm doing something for the first time to make sure that it's going to work in that room that I'm in. Um, and so it does take a little bit of, of planning and time ahead of time. I think that the things have gotten better the way that the, the systems are able to integrate into the talks and go back and forth has definitely gotten better over the past, you know, five years or so. So I'm having less and less um, problems. It seems to be becoming more and more sort of seamless. And so I, I think it's getting better. Um, but it's definitely something to be to be aware of, and it, it definitely you need you need to do, to do run throughs when you're when you're planning on using this. And an, another situation where you need to be an agile teacher, John. If the uh, yeah, technology exactly. fails, you've got to be able to deliver the material anyway. Yeah. Have you used um, polling or or audience response in any setting other than education? Um, I've used it for like similar to you for it's still sort of an education, but when I'm uh, trying to gather data from my fellows, uh, uh, you know, specifically about their education or from our faculty about, you know, things that they think and, and sort of in place of, of, of surveys um, sometimes. Um, and so um, not a ton outside of education, though, I would say. Sure. Me either. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavercombe and Dr. Scherner, for this excellent and very thoughtful presentation. And thank you so much, everyone, um, for attending and for asking questions and being engaged. Uh, do stay tuned for our next live webinar. It will be on learning objectives and will be scheduled soon. So please note, we will be offering a medical educator track at our upcoming annual meeting, CHESS 2018 in San Antonio, from October 6th through 10th. For more information, please visit chestmeeting.chestnet.org. Thank you so much, everyone.